Masters of the Universe, Clash for Eternia. We're continuing our analysis. We've been exploring some of the different missions, looking at that framework, that tactica, and mixing in the various characters. And in this vlog, I want to explore Orko. Now, certainly in capturing the narrative, there's really two ways to approach this game. You can play it from the pure meta. I mean, it is a solid skirmish-based system. You're going to look at the mission, whether you're a player or the controller, you're going to make your decisions and you're going to go and play very tactically. Or there's certain characters based on your narrative, based on your relationship with the IP that you like to play for whatever reason. So I'm not discounting Orko, but truly this character, I think more than um, any of the characters in the core box, really captures the narrative of Eternia really captures the narrative of Masters of the Universe. What I mean by this is, compare that to Evil Lynn, Orko's magic is unreliable all over the place, and you can either succeed amazing or absolutely epically fail. If you're the type of player that wants to control the random, you can't eliminate the random in the game because... It is based on dice. You're going to use your energy to influence the dice. You're going to use your powers and your level ups to possibly add to the dice or change to the dice or build in some sort of safeguard like an invasion or extra armor. But even with all that, sometimes you'll roll not so well. You can try to minimize that. Some players want to do that. You build a solid team. Other players will embrace that and say, look, I can fail big. But I can also win big. So from that perspective of Orko, the first thing that I'm looking at based on his magical attacks, no armor, not a ton of health. I mean, look, not everyone's going to be He-Man or Beast-Man coming in at 10-10. But the fact that um, Orko's magical attacks, you have the ability to overcharge it. Now, the base attacks by themselves, the magical attacks are very powerful. The fact that I can overcharge that that's where things get interesting because if you wound another character, then if you overcharge it, there's a possibility you might take them out. It might blow up in your face and cause wounds and take you out. But what we begin to see here is, can you embrace that random? Now, how we control that, of course, would be, um, do I use it? Depends really on his health, in my opinion. Orko's health, if it's high enough, then I'll take that risk. If it's low enough in the middle area, I might not. If I'm down to one or two health, then probably I will blast it out because, look, if it doesn't kill me next turn, it's you're probably going to kill me. So from that perspective, how you want to use it, how you want to kind of push that. But let's put that aside for a moment because I almost, um, I almost find the attacks for Orko to be secondary. And this is where things get a little bit um, interesting, where we talked about certainly this is a skirmish-based miniature game and the attacks and dice manipulation, dice influence in terms of reactions, um, empowerments, getting re-rolls. That's vital. That's vital. But second to this, there's certain secondary abilities that some of the characters have which um, equally impact skirmish-based games. We explored Tila the ability to spawn elite henchmen. Um, minions, the ability for Beastman to spawn, that's huge. Any type of game where you can add more miniatures, that's huge. What we see with Orko, as things begin to escalate, we see the possibility for teleport. That's really interesting for um, getting out of being surrounded. That's really interesting for a little bit of a movement boost. That's interesting for getting around tight spaces. This, um, this kind of makes Orko the opposite of Evil Lynn, where Evil Lynn's going to be a magical damage dealer. But Orko, the magic is kind of secondary, the attack magic. I want to be teleporting around, grabbing um, artifacts, grabbing scrolls, uh, getting out of certain scenarios. There's power there. Then as we escalate, what's really interesting is the ability to counter magic, the counter spell, the ability to essentially try to shut down, pump all of my energy into it, try to shut down the controller with their strategy cards. 
and how that escalates at the red level, right? As, as the player character, you've got your core abilities, but then as the game goes on and the sort of power escalates uh, from green to yellow to red as we go up that track, you level up. The controller's going to level up also, but you level up and you get to pick one side of the card. The counter spell is interesting because it comes in at the red level. As you're leveling up, the controller is leveling up with their controller board and their resources and their strategy cards. Hopefully, they've been pocketing those and building those for that final one-two punch at the end. There's been a couple of games where I have to say, if Orko's on the table, the ability to counter that, that's that's been huge. You know, the Overlord has just been waiting. The controller's just been waiting for that moment. And for you to be able to shut that down, that's the true control of magic so i see orco kind of as um more of a strategic grab and go kind of more as a strategic counter to the controller and the decision in my mind if i'm taking orco where i I like to play with all four players just because i mean we've got some iconic masters of the universe characters there i want to get them all on the table i mean i've got all all the TV lines memorized, including the movie also. I mean, you know, we overlooked Dolph and things like that, but I have all these lines ready to go. I want to be able to utilize them, so I want to take all of the characters that I can. In that regard, um, if I look at the pure tactical level, um, if I'm playing the players, I get to level up from green to yellow or maybe orange, depending on your color interpretation, and and red. And we're going to utilize all those. The controller, they have their characters leveling up. They have the control of the minions, but really it's that, that, that controller board of strategy cards, of resources. That's what you really want to leverage. And outside of Orco, there's no real way, um, at least in the core box, to shut down, to, to shut that down. So what we see here, regardless of the mission... The controller, yes, they're going to be using their characters, but they're also going to be utilizing those resources because as a player, you don't have them. I can't stop them. I can't take that away because that's the balance of the game, the the tactic of the strategy that we have to um, be able to navigate. But I can, but I can try to throw a wrench into that. I can, can try to take some of that Orco magic and just absolutely mess it up. So your thoughts on that? Again, my thoughts are I, I do occasionally take Orko. There's other characters with, I enjoy playing more so. But when I do take him, I have to remind myself, you know, the magical attacks are really unreliable. If I'm going to push that, I do it in the beginning when I can afford to take some damage. But based on the mission, the escalation or objectives, if a character getting knocked out hurts me, then I just play conservative and it's just kind of a average ho-hum magical attack. Likewise, it's kind of interesting um, just for one kind of alpha strike. If I'm down to one or two life, I'm going to be killed next turn, right? Trap draw's got me in the sights. Going to burn two attacks. I'm down to one life. I'm, I'm dead next turn. Um, if they activate first on the board, I'm dead. Otherwise, I'll at least get a parting shot. So you know what? Let's burn everything. See what happens. But it's really the second and third level escalation of teleport and counter spell slash counter magic that, in my opinion, is where this character tactically really, really shines.